Thanks for listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos and the PCC Multiverse. Check out more great podcasts today on one of these awesome affiliate networks. You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. The Tangibound Network. Check it out. Tangiboundnetwork.com. Listen to this show, the latest episode, every time. A proud member of the Gunna Geek Network. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all the other geeky podcasts over at GunnaGeekNetwork.com and get ready because geekiness begins in 3, 2, 1. Don't be alarmed. The quasi-shimmering light before you is a trans-dimensional gateway to other worlds, other voices, other thoughts, and other realities. Up feels like down, and down feels like the number seven on a Wednesday morning. Don't worry. That quivering, blood-boiling sensation under your eyebrows is all a part of the charm. Welcome to the PCC Multiverse. And we're back with the Pop Culture Cosmos. It's Gerald coming right back at you here. It's my good friend indeed talking with me today on something that's very much talked about in the world of geekdom. It is Kevin Smith's latest adventure reviving a brand that many of us out there have known and loved for quite some time. It is Masters of the Universe Revelation. And for me, I've actually been calling it incorrectly now for weeks. I've been assuming it's just He-Man Revelations. And I realize now, when I booted it up on Netflix, because it's now available on Netflix, the first five episodes of season one, that it's not about just He-Man after all. It is more of the Masters of the Universe part. But it is Kevin Smith's footprints all over the place. It is something that I enjoyed. I was rather surprised. Something that I did not expect, but it is something I do actually really enjoy. And here today to talk about Masters of the Universe, Revelation, who better to talk about that, is a good man indeed. He is our He-Man expert. I know I was called a He-Man expert. I am no He-Man expert next to this guy. He is the director behind the upcoming documentary dealing with a facet of the Masters of the Universe, Faking Filmation. And you also know him with his partner in crime, Jay Bartlett, for season two upcoming of Action Figure Adventure. There you go. Branding. It's all about branding. It is my good friend indeed. You also got to catch all the stuff that he's doing and has done, all of his back films, his documentaries, and so much more. It is the award-winning director, Rob McCallum. And Rob, great to have you here, my friend, Kevin Smith. This was a passion project for him. And i uh, tell you what, looks like for me it's paid off, although... A lot of angry fans out there review bombing it as we speak, and I'm assuming that's because of the way that they don't like the direction that Kevin Smith took the Masters of the Universe. Well, I can't speak on behalf of all those passionate fans that just feel so compelled to clank away on their keyboard with such disapproval of something that is an imbued, embiggened with imagination in fun. Embiggened. Yeah, to quote The Simpsons, the spirit embiggens us. Yes. Uh, it's it's a show that is all about fun and childhood and imagination. And, you know, if you can't enter on that level, then you've got many other problems. And I'm sure there are many a good therapist waiting to talk to you about all your problems with Saturday morning and afternoon cartoons. And if you just can't let go that something new is coming into the world that isn't exactly the way you want it, note for note, then I, I urge you to pick up the phone today, dial some help. And, and then get to the root of those problems and, and rediscover that magical thing that you once had as a child known as fun. It, it's, it's worth the effort. I, I, I implore you, look up what fun is and, and go down that path and try to rediscover it for yourself. Now, this series takes place in what would be kind of a continuation of both the original series and also the movie as well. Not the many other. Uh, uh, it, it, okay, uh, it touches. It touches a little bit on the movie. I, I want to reframe that. Okay, I need to reframe that okay. because the part of the controversy that's out there with all the 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 he trolls that that are that are coming out of the woodwork right now is that it was uh, touted as this continuation of the filmation line. 
everybody knew that it was going to have an anime look based on uh, the early conversations as well. But it was supposed to pick up right where the Filmation line of cartoons ended and was to carry the story, story forward for a definitive conclusion. And not just like, here's another episode week after week, like an actual arc uh, across 10 episodes. And like you said, we've got episodes one through five, part one of season one exclusively on Netflix right now. And that's not accurate. I understand the buzz and the potential advertising behind that and why it gets people excited. Not sure well, that let, was well, the let me say best this. move. Because well, let all me I say can this. say is that what we got was rooted in most of or some of the canon that was established in the Filmation series. Not proper to say a continuation because there's a lot of things that changed that a were lot of established that in Filmation and tweaked it going forward. But... There's a lot of canon that they essentially took the principal concepts of, as well as the 2002 well, they, show, and merged them together for this new beast. Well, there's a lot of IP. When you type in He-Man, there's a lot of stops yes. and starts for this IP. Uh, but I will say that it does truly start checkered. episode one. And we are going to go into spoilers here, to just let everybody know out there. But it starts with episode one. And I think why a lot of people may be misled is the original beginning, because it recreates that original episode beginning with, you know, I'm Prince Adam, but then I turn into He-Man and, you know, I, I have the power. That whole start, that first episode, the way it starts off would lead people to say, oh, this is going to be a continuation of that original series verbatim. But it goes off in completely bold and new directions. It, it modernizes it. It makes it more diverse. It makes it more acceptable to a general audience and to me i thought it was actually a very good series so far through the first five episodes i know heaven forbid we ever get anything new because when we don't get something new uh, there's accusations of getting the same thing over and over again oh you're just doing the same thing with the with a new coat of paint like you can't please anybody just embrace any differences because it doesn't change what you got okay I really like where they're going with this. I can't make up my full mind. I can only go based on what we have so far. I really hope they stick the landing because they've cast the net wide. They've, they've included a lot of problems and conflicts and, and what's going on with the world and how it's transformed of Eternia and what all the central conflicts are and, and some evolutions within that and some character arcs. But now comes the, the definitive point. Episodes six through 10 are what's going to matter most. Can they tie it up? Can those arcs stick true? Yeah. And, and and will it really finally do what has been promised? And, and the thing is, when you have an arc like that for 10 episodes, you know, you've done so well with the first five episodes. Is six through 10 going to be a little bit too much, too much filler? Could they could they have closed this out? Maybe a six to eight episode arc. You know, that's, well, that to me is the, the thing I wanted to, to say. I think. I think now it's it's on a point where it looks like you could go ahead and close it out within two or three episodes to have a nice, uh, you know, arc and whatnot. If if ten episodes, another five episodes of this, I'm not sure if he's going to be able to provide enough meat there for those rest, rest of the five episodes. Because he's shown team, so much in those first five episodes. I think the team can totally do it because what you have to basically look at the first five and the second five are as basically two standalone feature films. It's mm -hmm. like 124 minutes or something like that for the first five episodes. Basically, Act 1 is Episode 1, and then Act 2 is Episodes 2, 3, and 4. And then Act 3 is that fifth episode. And now we're going to get basically a, a feature paired with it to conclude it. This arc was all about how Eternia has changed and how things have gone from 180. Tila being honored as Man at Arms and now leading the castle going forward. And she turns and throws it away. But she, she comes to learn why people had a secret from her. And so does everybody else. You know, everything that they thought and held true was taken from them. And they all managed to come back 180 to where it was. So there, there's been a lot of arc and growth. Now we're going to see, I don't think Prince Adam is mortally wounded at the end. We truly have Prince Adam as the mortally wounded hero who's going to have to go up against the greatest version of his foe ever in Skelegod in order to you know, make Eternia in, in full balance again, whatever that means. But we've got, you know, another five episodes to figure that out. And I think that's the most logical arc that we're going to see. It, it really grinds my gears, Gerald, when I hear people say, oh, it's not as good as the Filmation or it's not as good as the 2002 series. It's a different beast. Both of those shows were episodic entries. We're like, let's go look at Buzz Off. Let's go look at Stratos. Let's go, like, Mechanex Lament was an episode in 2002 about 
how sad it must be for Mechanek just to have a long neck when everybody else has powers. Like, give me a break. 2002, I love the series. It's great. There's a lot of strong points in it, but it's not a, a serialized endeavor. This is a serialized endeavor. It's an entirely different beast to try to create this compared to that. Now, I do wish Netflix would have taken a page out of The Mandalorian's playbook and released these episodes weekly, one by one by one, instead of just dropping them all. Let a bit of water cooler hype happen. Let people get excited about it. Let them wonder. Even just extend that hatred that the heat trolls want to, you know, douse gasoline all over. But just let's talk about it week after week, which also shortens the time it feels like until we get the second half of season one. So I think that's a common complaint about a lot of things that they do at Netflix is that people will talk about what's on Netflix for a week and then they'll move on because, yeah. yeah, And that's, that's something that, uh, you know, they don't want to change right now. I'm hoping that they will. Sometimes they do though. Right. Like I'm in Canada and Netflix has Canadian rights to a lot of shows that appear in the U S. So we get episodes week after week, especially CW fair where we get new episodes every week, two days later after they premiere in America. So well, I think it's also them. a matter of taste because, I mean, before the pandemic, people were loving the fact that they could binge watch and binge you know, yeah. five, ten episodes and whatnot. Now, like you said with The Mandalorian, I think that has changed the mindset on how people want to perceive and, and view streaming shows. It's a discussion we had about action figure adventure and ultimately the broadcaster uh, wanted to do a week by week rollout. And, you know, it was the best thing for the show because people got to really get attached to it and talk about it week to week to week for 10 straight weeks. I think you get more value out of it than, you know, hoarding somebody's attention over the, over the course of a weekend. And then it's gone and forgotten about it makes it that much harder to to market the second half in this case of, of season one, episode six through 10 because people forgot about it so much long ago. They didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. They may have spent a lot of time clacking their keyboards with hatred and putting it out there. And, oh, my God, you wrecked my childhood. And how dare I watch somebody else in a show called Masters of the Universe that isn't He-Man? How dare you, you know, not feature the most boring character in the ensemble cast, you know, for two hours long? Oh, my goodness, heaven forbid that there's an actual character arc and drama and human conditions instead of a magical guy who could just punch everything out of his way. Heaven forbid we get to see something where there's stakes involved. But that's what they did. And that was the right choice. But the thing is, though, with Netflix, like you said, people will lose interest by the time the second part of it comes out because Netflix just throws so much at you with content time and time again that sometimes, you know, the projects like these could get buried by the time yeah. the second part comes out. Yeah, I mean, it depends what's going to be in the cycle. We don't know when episode six through 10 of Masters Universe Revelation is going to drop. Uh, it could be February. It could be next summer. It could be later this fall. We don't know. It's a complete guessing game. I imagine there will be some sort of announcement at PowerCon this September. I believe it's the weekend of September 11th. Uh, and I know there's a lot of the voice cast that are going to attend and be giving talks and panels and such like that. So they might even show a trailer for the second half. Who knows what's going to happen. But PowerCon would be the first uh, event on the calendar to learn anything else about uh, part two of season one. And uh, I'm re- I really look forward to to what's going to happen in the next episode because i think they did a a good job i think it's a very safe storyline the whole let's go to the underworld and then come back and you know essentially go to uh, mount olympus or so to speak Uh, heaven or what you know that they called it yeah heaven and hell even the analogy that they made between heaven and hell i didn't like them using such colloquial like earth terms yeah um you know we're on eternia do we know heaven and hell not really again I can get beyond beyond all that stuff. I can get beyond the fact that Skeletor knows to say, you know, by the power of Grayskull, I have the power, when he shouldn't know that phrase at all, except for seeing Adam in that very one moment at the end say it. How does he know? Again, I don't care. It's fun. The idea of Skeletor saying that those lines is cool enough for me to just buy on board because you know what? I'm not afraid to have fun. I'm, I'm, I, I know how to enjoy something without overthinking it. Just because you have a keyboard and an opinion, it's okay. Just dial it back and maybe you'll learn to find something. Or if you want to hate it, totally cool. But I dare you to find three to ten things that you actually really like about it. And what happens when you focus on those things? My goodness, you might actually convince yourself that it is worth watching. I think it's worth watching. I enjoyed it. It exceeded my expectations. Even though I watched the show and the series, the original series of it back in the day, 
I don't have the highest opinion of the show. I've teased you on the show several times in regards yes. to the animation, the corny plot lines, the PDSAs at the end. The only thing for me was Skeletor. That really was the part that I enjoyed. And I had to come to grips with Alan Oppenheimer, not in role, but when you have the world's greatest voice actor, Mark Hamill, doing the voice of Skeletor in this series, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. Although, you know, I still miss Alan Oppenheimer's voice there instead of Moss Man. I mean, yeah, to me, it's he's Skeletor, man. He's Skeletor. He's Skeletor. I mean, uh, it's it's very clear that it's Mark Hamill as Skeletor. Uh, I don't feel like it's a new performance. It's a hybrid between what he what he's done with the Joker and what yeah. he did as Skektek, which is the Skeksis scientist from the Dark Crystal uh, series you, uh, that was also. Did you love the line the in episode five that was totally a uh, callback to Star Wars? Uh, you'll have to you'll have to illuminate the audience when he the talks to when he talks to Evelyn about uh, coming to back to you know coming back to side with Skeletor, and he drops a Star Wars reference you know come back to you know to my side you know just and stand by my side just to, it was almost word for word from what uh, and together we can rule the galaxy yeah you know, so we can, that, we can that, rule that the cosmos or whatever it was pretty right? yeah pretty much so yeah there was uh, no irony there so. I, it was, again, you got to take it for what it's worth, but I think it's a step forward. It's progressive. It's diverse. It, it my, meets my general entry audience. Point, so anything that DC has done in the direct-to-video you know, superhero stuff, then that's all I want. Like You're not going to come up with a story that's going to revolutionize storytelling or cinema or animation. Like So where are these the expectations of these people? Again, Jay and I talked about it last night on our on our YouTube reaction where we go over for about an hour talking about all these different points and elements of the show. Like, what are you looking for? Like, really, what are what are you hoping to find? He Man is the most boringest character in the world. He he has, he suffers from the same problem as Superman, largely in that how does he arc? How is he challenged? What does he have to do to actually evolve and, and become a character that isn't just show up? punch be compassionate and and help out other people he's a tough character everybody else has something to lose even adam has something to lose which is why i've always said prince adam is my favorite character and this series has done prince adam justice he makes the ultimate sacrifices you know you feel the burden of the secret he has to carry by him talking about that burden with the people that didn't know specifically tila there's just a lot of great human emotion in this which is really great for something that's so focused on magic and technology in a lord of the rings star wars like environment thanks for checking out the pcc you know the pop culture cosmos we'll be back in one moment big on america hey guys this is jason dutch with dig on america podcast and i'm here with big hops and i'm also here with Mikey Famine. Think on America here, we explore how American history, policies, and sometimes even our pop culture created the social and political issues facing Americans today. You can check out our website, digonamerica.com. We're on every single audio podcast app there is out there, Pandora, Spotify, etc. Subscribe on YouTube. You can check us out on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash DOA podcast. Hopefully you'll listen to the show, guys. Big on America. It's more than just him saying, I have the power, than suddenly getting a spray tan. You know, it's just, it's something much more powerful than that. Yes. And having Tila being at the head of it, I thought was a very interesting and very bold and very creative turn. And I personally enjoyed that aspect of it. But it's not really, because if you look at the 130 episodes of Filmation, she, she has plays, like four yeah. or five episodes that are just about her. Yeah. And doing like literally Tila's quest is an episode yep. where she goes off and she leads the charge. She's captain of the Royal Guard. And now in this, she's, you know, the man at arms, which I thought was an interesting choice. They could have called her the woman at arms at the very least. But it, it, to have her carry the arc for three of the five episodes really didn't bother me because she's such an essential character anyways. And if it bothers you, then you probably haven't watched the 130 episodes that Filmation put out or the 39 episodes that Mike Young productions put out in 2002 because she is a staple character it'd be no different than watching han solo you know take the lead in the baton uh like they like he did kind of in episode seven where you see him in the forefront with ray feels very similar to me 
uh, with the way that that can change. You know, Star Wars worked without Mark Hamill uh, having to be in every scene. That's because there's strong supporting characters. It's no different with Masters. It's no different with Masters. I thought, again, it was a very enjoyable experience. It's something that I was pleasantly surprised at. It wasn't just a rehash of what we saw back in the day. And I think that's for the better for the series. But again, it comes down to, like you said, a lot of negative adversity from those who have quite a fondness for that original series. But, but I, don't, I, I understand that. that because nothing changes that original series. It's still there. It's just like Star Wars fans. You still have your Old Testament original trilogy, and that's for you. Nobody's going to touch that. You don't have to like or even watch the other stuff. Don't. It's okay. We'd prefer you didn't. But if you want to check out something new and dare to expand what you like in your mind, then that's great. You don't have to take all or nothing either. You can like certain aspects. That's why I said anybody that doesn't like it, just name me three to ten things that you do like to show me that you're actually putting critical thought into this that you're actually trying to put an effort forth instead of just pouring gasoline and hatred because you know what, the world has enough of that. And frankly, if you're going to contribute to that, I don't care if you like it or not. I really don't have any respect for your opinion unless you're willing to try to see the other side of the coin as well. And the thing is, you got to understand right after it shows that it's a Netflix production, that it's in conjunction with Mattel. And if, yeah. yeah, and if Mattel wants to go ahead and reinvigorate the series, which obviously they have a great interest in, mm. and if it does catch on, they want to catch on with a younger audience. It, you Absolutely. Know, if you, yeah, I mean, it's great that they put out stuff there if they do it at Christmas time and all that, and all the old He-Man collectors, they all get they get their share of the stuff, but. It's not about the individuals that originally watched that show in the day. It's about garnering a new audience, about bringing in young people for today. And what are what do we want to show people for today? We want to show a more diverse, acceptable, more promising, more positive outlook on things. And I think this show does it. I mean, ultimately, the the branding and the original fans are aging out. You know, every 20 years we get Masters of the Universe. Had it in the 80s, had it turn of the century, and now we have it now. If this doesn't work, it's a good bet we won't get any more for another 20 years. Uh, what's the best that this is going to do if it's wildly successful on Netflix? Maybe five seasons at 10 episodes each. So maybe we'll get 50 episodes total. We got to attract, you know, a, a younger audience in order to carry the torch of, of He-Man, which yeah. is why they have two series coming out, of course. They have Revelation, which was always dubbed as something for the fans. And then they have a CG cartoon coming out uh, that's dubbed for kids, you know. And I think that's a cool approach to not, you know, really divide fans. Was like, look, this is for you and this is for everybody new. The people that we actually really want to care about it, but maybe they'll like this as well because they're related. It's all about finding that new audience to take the torch. Transformers has done it well over the years. It's always been popular. Transformers is an evergreen brand, and so has TMNT. TMNT always finds a way to reinvent itself because the themes of both having to transform and change in order to save the day and, and change who you are, actually physically in the case of Transformers, plus emotionally, and Turtles, that core concept of family sticking together no matter what the odds are, they're just really popular themes. Masters of the Universe has always been the theme about empowerment. Do you have the power to do this? Uh, how far can you go? And who are the other people as your supporting cast that, that want to share that power and that belief in you? And I'm hoping that, you know, this gets the moms and dads excited that grew up with it and that we can bring the kids along too uh, with either the new show or, or this current one. And that's something that people have to get used to seeing. I mean, uh, they should be understanding that all these older IPs from back in the day, when they get brought back, when they get revisited, they're going to change. They're going to evolve with the times. Yeah. Yeah. And we saw that when we made Power of Grayskull, uh, the documentary we did on He-Man as well, which ended uh, as Super 7 put out the Three Terrors, which was very much uh, a filmation homage that had Alan Oppenheimer doing the voice of Skeletor. People were like, oh, it's not quite as good as it was in the 80s. It's like, well, he's 40 years older. You know, his vocal performance is going to change. The, the man is allowed to age. I it's, love it's okay. that Geico commercial he did. Absolutely love the Geico commercial. Yeah, there was a Honda commercial, too. I don't know if it was his voice or not, but, you know, He-Man and Skeletor. Like, you've been sending me Easter eggs for the last four to five years. Like, 
look, here's that dirty dancing parody. Here's, you know, here's this little spot. It's like, oh, it looks like it's in the background because you've always been a doubter of my passion for Masters of the Universe. And here we are. You know, the chickens have come home to roost, Gerald. I told you from the beginning when I did Power of Grayskull. I told you when I was setting up Faking Filmation that it's out there. And now we have Masters of the Universe Revelation, episode one through five on Netflix. A, a action-packed, uh, anime-driven, but a very story-centric new version of, of of what everybody loves about masters and the thing that works for me the most about what they've done is they haven't grounded it in filmation they haven't grounded it in 2002 the real grounding for so much of this in my opinion are the toys you see so many of your playtime friends in plastic that you had as a kid you see all the vehicles all the play sets snake mountain looks exactly like the play set which we've never seen in a show before with the weird Muppet monster head and the, and the wolf gate that was called out. That was only in the toy. No show has ever done that. You see the Bastasaur, you see the land shark, you see the Rotons and they're all the toy versions of these things, which we hadn't seen before. So they're taking the toys as that storytelling Bible. And that's what is pushing stuff forward. And I just, I think it's a great way to ground stuff. And of course being Mattel and Mattel television, why not, you know, kind of use that in those assets in that library to help populate your world? I just think some really great decisions, so many more good decisions than poor ones or better executed ideas than poorly executed ones. Yeah, I mean, and there's there's uh, some interesting arcs for these characters. As of now, certain individuals are out as far as death is concerned in regards yep. to some certain deaths personally i enjoyed orko dying and finally actually being somewhat confident because i was getting i, I got tired back in the day of his act uh, i get it i get it you're you're a terrible magician i get it you're a terrible magician and uh, to see him finally get a comeuppance and proven that he can save the day at, at a certain point was great and to see his character off for now now we think that you know who knows what the other next who five knows episodes. anything's possible nobody yeah. stays dead forever in comics right isn't it, that the rule? that's true a lot of seen. people i've talked to said wow i wasn't really a big fan of orko but this version of orko had people sympathizing with him and yeah, then when he was able exactly. to to summon the personal self-confidence and strength and literally stand up to the face of fear people were like chanting for him and like felt like a loss happened when he was gone yeah, you much, know, so much I thought more you know, redeeming. For, for them to be able to pull these reversals off and take some of the characters that maybe weren't as loved and as treasured as as they had been and really make favorites out of them, really cool. Absolutely. I've always been a partial to Man at Arms myself and to see him presented throughout the story arc because he's in, I think, one, four, and five, if I'm not mistaken. He because of the certain actions that are taken, he gets exiled because of what yeah. was perceived by the king. I really, truly enjoyed his arc and how well he was represented in this because I thought he was represented much better here than in the original series as well. Well, again, we're not dealing with a 22-minute story and the next week it's almost like it didn't happen. This yeah. is serialized, so characters can breathe and grow. Yeah. You have cause and effect and you have consequences for the actions of these characters that we get to see paid off. So I'm hoping that anything that happens to any of these characters, people feel more about them because they can get attached to them longer. Yeah. And I think people will really yearn for that He-Man to come back after the sacrifices that Adam has made. I, I'm just excited for the toys, to be honest. Yeah. I haven't been sold up to this point. I really wanted to see if the show would hook me and I think it did a good job. I'm not a huge fan of wave one that's out there right now. And they gave Skelegod away. And even knowing that Skelegod was an action figure that looks really awesome. I was something that I forgot about when I watched this. I've seen, I've seen episodes one through five twice now, and I just watched it all the way through. So I couldn't tell you where episode one, two, and they all end and begin. It's just, it's one feature in my mind and that's just yeah. how it is. Well, that's how I watched it as well. Just boom, 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 cool. back to back. I think that's probably the best way for a lot of fans to see it. I mean, I know a lot of people were dumping on it right after episode one, and they just couldn't really handle it. And I'm like, you got to give oh, it a chance. You got to give it a get chance. Get into the story then. I wasn't in love with the animation style. I mean, I think it's okay. Probably but my I've only been, con I, would come with, with the animation. The the blend of 2D and 3D yeah. didn't always work for me. I thought even in 2002, they had a similar approach, but they nailed it better than I saw in this. I felt when I saw that those CG vehicles or, or landscapes, it, it pulled me out more than I would have liked. 
but I, you know, as a filmmaker, maybe that's just something that I pay attention to more than well, other people. And for are. someone me who's been watching a lot of animation lately, especially with Space Jam that just happened around the corner, mm. I'm I'm trying to get a little bit more picky about the animation I like and I don't like. And it's coming off of Space Jam, where for me one of the few positives was the incredible animation and the way it took it to another level. I think that watching this, I understand they don't have the same budget, mind you, but still yeah. seeing the type of modern technology from similar projects, I really would have liked something a little bit better, animation-wise. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can see that. But I've said from the beginning, whether it's the style, the look, the, the aesthetic, it's always going to come down to story for me. Yeah. So it has to be about the story. Prince Adam's always been my favorite character, as I said. I want to see people really take that character on with Gravitas because he has the weight of the world on his shoulders. And they finally really painted a picture of that where you see the weight and you feel the weight of what he has to deal with more than once, which is which is great. And that's, for me, something that's going to keep me watching because I'm pretty much going to tell you right now, I expected going in to either just poo-poo after the first episode or after the five episodes, I was just going to check on out. I am bought in to something that I really didn't think I was going to be bought into. And that's credit to Kevin Smith. I've not been a super fan of his. I know he's the altogether God of geek as he's been called over the years. And I've been more a respect for his love of geek than actually liked a ton of his projects. But this to me is one of his best. And I'm really he's, uh, uh, a chance to watch it. He's certainly a pop culture banner waver. It's it's hard to describe yeah. what Kevin Smith is. He's kind of like an ambassador for anything that's geek, retro, or cool. We interviewed him for Action Figure Adventure when the series was first announced. And that was like, I talked with, you know, my good friend, Jordan Morris, you know, uh, uh, literally as I was boarding a plane when they announced Kevin Smith would be there. And I said, man, can you imagine anybody bigger in the pop culture community that we could possibly get to talk about something like Masters? Because you always try to get people that work on the actual brand, other people in the industry to talk about the brand, and then you get fans. At least that's how I make stuff. And so he was like number one in the middle there. And then he announced that he was working on it. So he like shot up to that upper tier because now he was a bit of everything. It, it's, it's hard to, to choose somebody better that could fill that role when you're trying to make these pop culture documentaries that we do. I don't love all his work either. I love that he takes chances. I don't care that he has the biggest budgets for some stuff. I'm excited to see what happens with Clerks 3. I yep. really enjoyed Clerks 2. You know, I got through all of 10 minutes of Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back reboot. I just I couldn't do it. I liked Yoga Hosers. I really liked Tusk. Red State was cool. I liked a lot of the stuff in the 90s, of course. So uh, Cop Out, it was fine for what it was, but it's not a Kevin Smith movie, you know? So yeah. But no, I really enjoyed what he, he did here and, and where he's going with it. And you could see his fingerprints all over the production, even though, like, his, like you said, he wrote episode one and he's the showrunner on it. And he's the big name behind it. And, you know, he got a lot of his friends involved. And that to me is also another big thing is because of the big all-star cast. You know, we don't have to go on the, on the list of names, but when you look at the roster of friends that he got into it, some of it is his regulars. But some of it is just a list that goes on and on. And that to me is, it, it helps make it work. I thought the vocal performances were awesome across the board. I thought Lena Headey was the all-star as Evelyn. Every scene she was in, I completely bought into her as Evelyn. Nothing felt off. Nothing felt funny. It, it all struck the right chord when it came to her. I thought Orca was fine. I didn't love Steven Root's Cringer. It just felt too human to me. It didn't feel like it was enough of a creature. You know, again, Alan Offenheimer does Cringer in the original series. It's like, oh, maybe you can give me some fish over here. And I like that there's just a little bit of personality over it than just a straight up, oh, didn't you remember? You're the one that named me Cringer. Like, it's just, it doesn't do it for me. It doesn't sound like a giant hulking cat. Merman with Kevin Conroy, who, of course, you know, was the voice of Bruce Wayne and Batman and Batman the Animated Series. Again, I was expecting Merman to have that, oh, oh, man, the gargling, you know, water rasping through his gills. So when he came out, it was like, oh, yes, blah, blah, blah. It's like very, like, deep and baritone. Like, again, I like the differences. It's such a departure that it's like, I don't know how to feel about it because my expectations were, this is Merman or this is this. So, again, just really interesting. 
and to have Alan Oppenheimer as part of the series as, as yeah. Moss Man, but yeah, still, gosh, yeah, it's it's so funny because you know I love and appreciate everything that Mark Hamill has done to the voice acting community, and of course, you know when he retires, Joker, don't ever play another Joker again as far as a new voice actor coming in because you know he he's killed it as as Joker, and he did a great job here. It's just Miss Alan, man, doing it. I think, it, it, but then again, with Alan, but then again, he, the he with he, Alan Skeletor, are menacing, right? Because if yeah. you want to look at the best Skeletor, you got we got to talk about Frank Langella, and like the like uh, masterful lines that come out of Frank Langella in the movie. You know, there's a lot of things to make you cringe when you watch that movie. It's becoming a a cult favorite for all those cheesy, campy reasons. But if you just go back and just watch Frank Langella, you know. And the lines that he helped come up with on the spot and, and craft, it's its just, it, it is truly menacing. So Frank Langella, I still think, is, is the best Skeletor that's out there. Catch you in the flip, suckers! But yeah, it, it does, it, to me, it's just Alan Oppenheimer. But again, his voice wouldn't fit into this parameter. It would, Correct. Because it part, it's part of that can't be passed. So this is a, a future step for the series, the IP, and I hope it sticks. I hope it sticks a good landing despite all the, the trolls and the individuals out there that want to speak out against it because it's not exactly what they wanted, like you said, with the 2002 or the, obviously, or the original series. But again, you want to close this out, my friend? Any last thoughts on this episode arc, the five episode arc before we have it head on out? Yeah, I'm just glad, you know, even if you are one of the he trolls out there that you're watching it, that Netflix is getting eyeballs on it. You know, it would be great if you watched all the episodes instead of just like pissing off after the first five or 10 seconds because you think you've made up your mind. And again, I I dare you, I triple dog dare you to come up with, you know, three to 10 positive things and just leave it at that when you discuss it. Just, Just see what happens when you say, here are the three things I like and then move on. I, I think, you know, if trolls were able to do that, we'd find that we all have the power and that we would get a lot more cool stuff in the world of fandom because nobody wants to invest millions of dollars into animated series like this just to have people shit on stuff. It's not worth anyone's time or energy. Exactly. But before we head on out, you've got your own He-Man related project in the works, plus another show, a season for your a popular show that's available on jinx tv is that correct i've got lots in the works gerald uh, you yeah, know you how that works yes, i got lots I in the works. works i'm excited that action figure adventure season one is now available on amazon prime in the u.s uh, i'm excited that we're in development and pre-production on faking filmation which is on the evolution of cartoon history and of course one man's quest to release his unofficial he-man faking filmation style mr james e talk is trying to get the return of faker out there and that whole film will chronicle his journey as well as like i said looking at the evolution of cartoons uh and yes we just did get the big news that action figure adventure will have a second season as well as the jay and rob toy show will have a second season as well so two season two agree jay and myself plus everything else that's happening so um season two of the jane rob toy show will broadcast in november and sometime in 2022 action figure adventure season two will come out absolutely watch out toy stores here he comes once again but it is my good friend the award-winning director that he is mr rob mccallum please follow rob mccallum today wherever you can on social media because it's always a great adventure always love to hear his thoughts He is the man behind so many great projects, and I hope you go ahead and support him today. And Rob, last but not least, again, I wish you all the best. Continued success. Please terrorize Jay continuously for me. And I I will. will Yes. So, but all my best to him. He's become a YouTube star in his own right. So I'm, I'm very happy for his success. But Rob, it's always great to have you here, my friend. And thank you so much for being part of the thing you helped create. The thing you have helped create with your fabulous voice and creativity, the Pop Culture Cosmos. You're listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos. And we're back. It's Gerald Glasser right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. You heard award-winning director Rob McCallum and his thoughts 
on the recent series, the five episodes of the 10 that's expected to come out. Kevin Smith being the showrunner of The Return of the Masters of the Universe and Masters of the Universe Revelation, per se. But here today to talk about on the other end of the spectrum and a guy who, I guess, leads this vocal minority in regards to his dissension towards the Masters of the Universe Revelation. Still a good man indeed. He, you've heard, seen and heard of as his Burger King crown, you know, I guess Jerry Lawler impersonation there. It keeps on falling down. You've seen him on Hunting Queen several times. It is a good man indeed. Please be gentle with him. Please be patient with him. I know he has a lot of ideals. Again, it is part of that dissension that is very unhappy with what's going on with Masters of the Universe. Revelation, it is knowing and fine and King Wrong Door. I don't know what <laughs> in regards to that, what you mean by that, but still in regards to it, you've been so happy with what you saw in masters of the universe revelation that you changed your entire social media profile to the old dungeons and dragons cartoon series, which don't get me wrong, stunk, but uh, we won't go there. I could stand it. I actually watched a couple of episodes. In fact, I actually watched that finished episode that they did to that. Somebody finally went back and put a post on YouTube and how they finished that series. I couldn't stand it, but Okay, need, need I say more? I'm not exactly the, and I've told this before, I'm not exactly the hugest fan of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, the original series. I've watched a lot of the episodes back in the day because I, I just was an afternoon cartoon kid. But I understand that it's cheesiness and it's raw sense of, I guess, uh, cult classiness, I guess, really endeared to a group of individuals out there. And I, I laid waste to the animation styles. I laid waste to the fact that Funimation tried to save every dollar that he could. I, I laid to waste that He-Man was a generic character, much in the same ways that, that Ron McCallum did. But it seemingly, I was still very skeptical going in to see Kevin Smith's envision of what the Masters of the Universe would be like. But I will say that I was quite surprised. I thought it was very good, and I thought it was modernizing it for a today audience, which I know is very much not appreciated by you and some some others out there. But my friend, before we go ahead and let you start and let you spew all the negativity, you got to realize that this these remakes, they're not meant for you. If you catch on and you buy the toys and you go ahead and get the collectibles, that's great. But it's not meant for you and I. It's meant for a new audience, a new generation, and a new world of what we're seeing in 2021 or any of these other revisions that are made out there. So you got to be understandable of the fact that this is what 2021 is all about. Yeah, but the, here's the thing, though. I actually had the three T's in the 80s. Thundercats, Transformers, and the real Ghostbusters. The okay, TV the real Ghostbusters, I will give you excellent, excellent story making. Yes, you know, I was crushed when they had to make that more kiddified and they put it back on Saturday morning cartoons and not on the weekday afternoons. I mean, I think the best episodes were when they were in syndication on the weekdays. Okay, but getting back uh, to He-Man. Yeah, you're... but getting back to He-Man. Okay, but here's the thing with He-Man. First of all, I was never a huge fan. I had a few figures when I was a kid. I had one playset, the slime playset, because I liked the mind control slime, and I got a case of it. Other than that, though, the PSAs I understood years later because of standards of practices and PSAs. I was fine with that. I didn't like the new adventures, and the 2002 was okay, but I was never – you know, to me, I grew up watching Conan, and I knew what this was. Eventually, I saw that Power of Grey Skull documentary, so I got it because Mattel was, decided not to – Which, not to, yeah, by they, the way, they, Ron McCallum co-directed. Yeah, I know. I understand that. I get that, and I get that it's Star Wars meets Conan. I get all of that, but my problem with this is, is that it's still supposed to be a toy commercial, and what made it work were the actors voicing the characters that made me want to buy the toy. When you bring in someone like He-Man, who you're already making toys for, and you kill him off in the beginning in Skeletor – Two of the major good versus evil cheesy characters of the 80s that are so iconic, and you kill them off already, and you bring in Tila, and you give her this bobside haircut and entitlement, and she just, you know, 
dissipates in, in, from the entire thing. She because... was always a major character in the series, my friend. And yeah, she, she was. She just plays a larger role here. And the thing is, they didn't kill off Skeletor and He Man. By the if spoilers, if you watch the end of the five episodes, they come back. And it's not like you're getting Alan Oppenheimer and the crazy silliness that they had before, which again, I was really the first person to say that I really didn't want the change to happen because I really wanted Alan Oppenheimer. But seeing Mark Hamill do it, obviously he's the best voice actor out there. He did as good a job as he can. He, it was acceptable to me. I really it, it liked that part. I didn't think that was bad in the limited role that he was in. Yes, He-Man and Skeletor were away for the first five episodes, but there's five more to go that could focus on them and make everybody happy. Yeah, but here's the other thing, too, is that when Mark Hamill talks, I hear Joker. When Merman oh, yeah, talks, I, 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 I hear, I'm I, not disagreeing with you. I hear Batman, and, and, and you know what? But as I was told, Alan Oppenheimer is 91. Yes, he is Moss Man and in there. And, but also, even if he's 91, and even if he could do the role, when you hear Skeletor do it in this context of a more serious nature, it, it would be kind of hard because Skeletor is the best part of He-Man, the series from way back when. He was absolutely far away the best part of the series. And I just think, you know, now that I look back on it, if he would have been Alan Oppenheimer doing, <laughs> you know, in this part, in this realm, in this modernized version, I'm not sure it would have gone over as well. Okay, then you have the 2002 voice actor to come back instead of Alan Oppenheimer. But uh, again, he, you know, he's still Alan Oppenheimer. That's a that's an argument for another day. But in regards to the story, I think it was very well played out. They threw a twist right in the beginning. They took it in a different, modernized direction, and I think it worked out for the best. Yeah, it worked out for the best when it was Superman Lives and, and uh, Death of Superman. Superman Lives in 1992. It's the same thing. And that's the thing, too, is that Kevin Smith, because he, he was working on Superman in the 90s, that didn't work out. He never even mentioned it in the past that he wanted to ever do anything regarding He-Man. He was apparently 12 years old, if I'm not too mistaken. I'm going by when he was born, and in 1983, he'd be 12. He's telling me he would run home and watch He-Man. Then he said he was a teenager. Now he's pretty much telling all his fans to grow up because it didn't work out the way you wanted it. No, the story wasn't that great. Well, I was 14 when I watched it. I'm going yeah, to be and honest I was, with you. Yeah, I understand it, but that's not the point. The point is is that if you weren't into it, then you shouldn't work on it if you're not passionate because you're still trying to sell toys. And the well, other Mattel problem, asked him. Remember, Mattel brought the, back the Brinks, Brinks truck and brought the, Mattel had, Yeah, but the, Mattel – and they had to go to his house. And yes. the, the, I understand because yeah, you wouldn't sign an NDA and go to Mattel. Yes. Right, right, and, and, and again – and because it's not working out now, he's backpedaling, and he's saying he was never really a fan, and he's telling people to grow up. You know what? I am a grown-up. And once we're done with this, I will not really – I have nothing better to do than to complain about a show that didn't work out 40 years ago that is not working out now because it's for a different generation. But there's a lot of men and women and kids – that are not getting into this series. That they're not. I don't know about the it. kids part. The kids part. I mean, it's all the adults. It's all the all the people who wanted to see continuation direct from the 1980s series. Let's get down to it. Those are the individuals that are review bombing it. I, the the critical praise has been there. I mean, a lot of positive critics. I mean, it's doing great on Metacritic. I mean, it's really solid numbers across the board there. This is a revival that's not garnered for you and me. It's not meant for you and I. But no, but I know, I know. Listen, listen. Even with with the new Transformers, I know it's not for me. The Thundercats that came out in two thousand eleven, I loved it. It wasn't for me, but I still enjoyed it. I don't like war, but my point being is that if you're going to bring back a series, then you at least have to say that I'm a, and not backpedal when people are complaining about it for reasons. And even women are complaining about, well, I wanted He-Man. Where is He-Man? And well, again, there's still five episodes to go. Right, but, but, but that's – you're doing five episodes now and five episodes six months from now. You really need to do – if you didn't want to binge it and not do it five in a row and do it weekly and do 13 weeks well, of one Netflix. episode. Right, that's I understand that. that. But you know what? You binge it. You don't binge it. There, there's nothing – other, other than this, this cliffhanger that, in all honesty, may well, I'm or glad may I did was... binge it. I would not. This was something I would not. Uh, I was, I was pleasantly surprised by it. I enjoyed it, but I'm not sure if I'm going to hold my, you know, watching it week in, week out. I, I'm glad I binged it. For me, this was something I was, I was, 
probably a more enjoyable. I disagree with Rob on that sense because I know he would have loved it more in an episodic weekly fashion. For me, I think it would probably be better if I binged this because maybe it would have captured and held my attention for that for week in, week out. It would have been something, okay, it's pretty good, but I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get back to it because I've got other stuff on the plate. I thought it was pretty good overall. I was pleasantly surprised. I was all willing to have the mindset to trash this, and I came out of it on the other end saying, you know what? I thought this was pretty darn good. And to me, I have to say, you build it up and you do something else that has nothing to do with. Well, I can't, I can't, I can't excuse his rhetoric. His rhetoric beforehand saying it was going to be something He Man fans would love, et cetera, et cetera. If he said or indicated stuff like that, that it was going to be from that end of the spectrum, I can't, I can't hold for what he's saying. I just have to go off by what I saw. And what I saw was a fan script of an eight year old who has toys. And is playing with them and wants to just do a fan script and put it on the all internet. Right. That, that right. I'm sorry, no, this is this is this was abysmal. And in all honesty, I I will never. I mean, I'll probably watch the last five episodes, but I have no. First of all, I have no respect for Kevin Smith ever again for reasons. This guy has lied one too many times, and I've met him in person. He's lied to me over something I'm not going to get into. But in all honesty, and, and it's not just the movie. This guy has been backpedaling and lying, and then he just doesn't know how to address his fans, and he gets upset. He tells them to grow up. You know, I have to be honest with you. This is how you turn away your fan base. Well, that's one thing I want to ask you. Okay, before we head out, take the Rob McCallum challenge, because he indicated in his interview with me that to all the haters out there for this, for the He-Man show, well, it's not the He-Man show. It is the Masters of the Universe Revelation. That was the first thing. That was probably the reason why I got so mixed up with it because I always presumed it was a He-Man show and it's not. And that's probably the reason why I liked it more because I was not a huge fan of He-Man. I was more, you know, man at arms. But, you know, as you know, I love Skeletor. (laughs) Catch you on the flip, suckers. But anyways, uh, before we head on out, he asked all the haters like you guys out there to do a He-Man challenge, to find three positive things that you can hand out of this because they're, even if you don't like it, there should be three positive things you can find out of it. Yeah, there are three positive things. I don't have to worry about watching the five episodes again. They're not rewatchable. That's a good thing. I don't have to worry about going back and watching the other show, comparing it to this, because in all honesty, I never had a dog in the fight to begin with. And it just gives me an excuse again to finally wean off of Kevin Smith. So those are the three positive things. But if you want another positive thing, the character models – they're a lot better than filmation because of their budget back then, but that still is insane much. I thought the animation was a little bit lacking personally, but that was but that's just... Netflix. And Netflix is doing that with all the you know, that that's that's besides the point. They have a they have a He Man anime is nothing terrible. Yeah. Well Has they have to... a whole bunch of, of animation. Right. Stuff. Well, uh, well that's they're what spreading yeah. out the cash. I get yeah. that. I yeah, yeah. I mean that that but no. Th- th- those are my three positives. Sorry. All right. Well, there you go. There you have it. The other side of the spectrum with our good friend, knowing and fine. I still have much love for you. You know, you're Thank just so you. great. My pop culture friend, you know, you've done so many great things here. So uh, no ill will between us in regards to it, even Thank though we you. have totally, totally opposite sides of the coin when it concerns Masters of the Universe. Again, I was pleasantly surprised and I give it a thumbs up. I know Rob McCallum does as well, but you know, there is a, a quite a contingent of individuals out there like Noe and Fine that feels kind of betrayed. And, uh, you know, if you if you were led to believe that, then I'm sorry. And you are, in a sense, right, if that's the case, because it did lead the series into a different direction. But again, for me, it led into a direction that's more modernized, more of 2021, more of the future. And when you're talking about Mattel... Mattel brought this to the feet of Kevin Smith saying, we really want you to do it because we want to go ahead and evolve He-Man and the Masters of the Universe for the future. And for now, I think it's done just that. But we'll wait and see. I'm going to, again, we're going to see how this ends out later this year with the last five episodes whenever Netflix decides to release them. Hopefully we can revisit this conversation again because you said you would watch the final five. You said you would watch the final five and we'll go from there. If it's even if it's all He-Man, but we'll talk about that, you know, when the time comes. But I hope you get a chance to talk with me again when we talk Masters of the Universe Revelation. But if you guys have thoughts out there one way or the other on this fight, we'd love to hear your thoughts. And it has been a big fight indeed. Popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. 
Noah, whether you're high on something or low on something, we're always glad to have you here. I feel like sometimes we need to go to the therapist chair and you're on the couch and you need to vent and I'm just taking notes or whatnot, but I'm still happy to have you here always, my friend. Okay. I just want to say one last thing though, is that it didn't ruin my childhood because I, I, I'm not going to go into the origins of my childhood. Okay, but trust nothing, me. nothing should no. ruin your childhood. No, 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 I don't no, 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 no. Like I'm just, right, I'm just, right. yeah, I just, let me just say this, that having a bad toy movie in the 21st century is not going to wreck my childhood with Transformers and what they did with Thundercats Roar and what they did with Teen Titans Go and what they did with this He-Man. No, my childhood is not ruined. I'm glad that I took out my toys and played with them, and I probably still would because that's what they're meant for, not collecting but that's just me. But unfortunately, this is probably the most disappointing reboot that I've seen in a very long time. Well, I'm sorry to hear you say that, but there are quite a lot of people that say otherwise. I mean, it's a very hot button issue right now in pop culture, and that is Masters of the Universe Revelation from Kevin Smith. That's now available on Netflix. Decide for yourself, catch the first five episodes, binge it, watch it whatever way you want to. But please, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Pop Culture Cosmos at Yahoo.com. My friend, it's great to hear from you. When you're very spirited like that, I know you're still out there in pop culture. So in that sense, I I know with what's going on in the world, it's still great to hear from you one way or the other. But always, my friend, you're always welcome here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. You're listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos. Any last thoughts on the way out? Yeah, we actually have two uh, emails to go through. Are okay. you uh, ready to take a walk down email street here? Oh, here we go. Here we go. All right. So let me let me throw you up on the screen here. Our first email is from uh, Jason Trellis from Tom's River, New Jersey. And he's saying there's a lot of talk in the gaming world lately about director's cuts. And when I say a lot, I mean just the two in the news lately. Ghost of Tsushima and Death Stranding. Kojima has stated that the Death Stranding director's cut is not so much a director's cut as much as a director's plus. In your opinion, what is the difference between a director's cut and an extended version of a film or game? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I guess for me, a director's cut would be exactly how the director envisioned it and him or her going on the record saying as such. And to me, that's whatever it's going to be like we saw with Zack Snyder and the Justice League. And if it's just an extended version of a film or game, then it's something that the publisher or film studio added on. I mean, we saw that with Blade Runner, the original one, going back mm-hmm. to our conversations so the with Blade Runner. Cut. Yeah, and I, all that. I mean, there's like seven or eight versions that are out there, depending on if you've seen them all. But yeah, there I believe there are seven or eight. I Yeah, there's several versions out there that one of which I think that Ridley Scott actually approves of, and that is the director's cut. Yeah, or the final the cut. The final cut, yeah. The final cut, yeah. But the rest of them were put out by the studio at various points in time. So I think that's probably the best way you can say it as far as a film or game is, did the director put his stamp of approval on it, or was it the studio behind it? Very good points. All right, you ready for me to hit you with email two? Hit it, hit it, hit it, hit All me right. with it. Okay, email All two right. here we have. From Elizabeth Langley in Vancouver, Washington. I haven't had a chance to watch M. Night Shyamalan's old yet, but I keep reading reviews that talk about the twist falling flat because he over-explains things. You see this a lot in modern filmmaking where the characters either constantly over-explain or they keep repeating themselves so the audience doesn't get lost. Do you think twists in films are lost on the modern audience? Have we all become too dumb to pick things up for ourselves? Well, I think the twists have been overdone in movies. I think there was a period of time early in the century, in fact, leading up to this past decade as well, where movies had to have a twist or they felt they had to have a twist. Yeah. And M. Night Shyamalan, the funny thing, as I mentioned before on the show, was that old is the first movie he's done in 20 years that did not have a twist or did not have a real shocking twist per se. To me, from what it sounds like on the ending, that it does not look like it's a spoiler, but it's looked like something that you could have figured out all along as far as how that transpired. So, yeah, I think that that right now, twists in films are lost on the modern audience. It's, I mean, you don't have to have a twist to have a great movie. I mean, no. Black Widow was an OK movie by my standards, but there was a twist in it. And I just didn't feel that it, it was OK twist. I was cool with it. I know a lot of people out there are not cool with it. But I thought it was okay for what it was. But 
it really didn't impress me one way or another. Just and I think that's something that I think maybe that's partly my fault as a viewer because I'm now become so insensitive to these twists that I feel like I'm going to have to watch a twist in each and every time I watch a movie. Yeah, I mean, and that's to the detriment of M Night Shyamalan, right? Like he had he went all in with his first few films and had these big twists in him, and so now everything he makes, people are expecting a twist to roll around. Um, yeah. As for like the audience part, do you think that the modern audience is not smart enough to like pick up on things? Do you think that if you were to not hold a hand through a movie that the ending would still be, you know, they'd get what they need out of the ending? I think you need to hold the hand of the audience to a certain extent. I just don't think you need to, to do it as much as some filmmakers feel like they have to, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. I, I still think you do to a certain extent because people still do get lost on certain movies. There have been movies that have come out where I just don't get this film. Why was this film made? I just don't get the storyline. I just don't get this plot. So I think you do have to hold the viewer's hand a little bit, but not to the extent I think that some studios and filmmakers think you do. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all we got for emails. Well, thank you so much for sending in those emails. We truly appreciate it. And remember, social media, Pop Culture Cosmos, wherever we're at, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, or Pop Culture Cosmos at Yahoo.com. Welcome to Dr. Geek's Laboratory. Hello everyone, Dr. Geek here with a shout out to all the scientists who worked tirelessly to bring a COVID-19 vaccine into reality. <laughs> Let's face it, creating something of this magnitude is a miracle worthy of Dr. McCoy himself. And now, Dr. Geek needs you to do your part. Remember, each shot is one small step back to normal, one giant leap to putting the pandemic behind us. We can do this. For more information, visit vaccines.gov to find your nearest provider. For the past 12 seasons, Mike and Mike have been bringing you a weekly look at all things geek with reviews, discussions, interviews, and topicals from across the geek history. Now with geek life slowly returning to normal in 2021, join the Earth Station One crew as we look at the return of the summer movie season, preview the fall TV lineup, look at all the big conventions now happening along with other geek topics. You can listen to Earth Station One wherever fine podcasts are found. And as always, Earth Station One is a founding member of the ESO Network. You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Tangent Bound Network. Let your voice be heard. TangentBoundNetwork.com Thanks so much for downloading the Pop Culture Cosmos and stay tuned as more great podcasts are on the way. Thanks again for listening to us here at the Pop Culture Cosmos.